Um, okay, perfect. So today's theme is radical, and I'd like to introduce you to Natalia Permiakova, who's the CEO and founder of Life Startup. She's a strategist and an innovator, um, and her and her team are on a mission to make the world more fulfilled and help people reach their full potential in this radical new world. Um, so I'd like to introduce you guys to Natalia, if you'd like, if you can unmute. Hello, everybody. Hi, Natalia. I'm just trying to share my screen, multitasking, multitasking. Hope you can hear me okay. Um, yes. Yeah. I'm really thankful in the spirit of Thanksgiving. I'm really thankful for being here with you and talking about this topic that is very close to my heart and that I'm passionate really about. Um, hang on, hang on, Natalia, hang on, sorry. Um, you guys, if, if you guys can mute yourselves, I think someone's in a taxi. <laughs> you can hear the radio. Perfect, thanks. Okay, go on. Um, yeah, by the way, if you have any comments or questions on the things that I'm going to say, just pop them into the chat box. I would love to, to kind of have it as an interactive session. And of course, there will be a Q&A at the end. And so, yeah. Radical is quite an interesting theme and quite an interesting topic, but this whole year has been quite radical, of course, and we're nearly at the end of it. We almost made it just one more month and December is always a great time to take a step back and do a bit of a reflection on our lives and um, there, there's been quite a lot of changes to society, to how we live, how we work, how we play and the global pandemic has accelerated those changes. And so today I want to talk about those radical changes and I will talk about the future trends, strategies uh, for the new world. And to make sure you go walk away from this talk with maybe a few thoughts uh, for how to redesign your life and make it even more fulfilling. So I'm Natalia. I am the founder and the CEO of Life Startup. And I originally am from Russia and I've lived in quite a few countries at the, uh, so far and Hong Kong was supposed to be on that screen but due to pandemic I'm currently sort of stuck in Switzerland, maybe not the worst place to be stuck in. Um, and I speak quite a few languages. I am location independent actually. So I don't, I'm not tied to any particular location as long as I have my laptop with me and of course access to great coffee. So if you have any good coffee recommendations for Hong Kong, please let me know because that's something I, I'm always super grateful for. But this hasn't always been this way. I have actually spent quite a bit of time working in a corporate world back in London and I've worked for a large consulting firm Accenture and I advised the leadership teams of large companies, some of the names you can see on the screen, on their strategies and I helped them adapt to the changing world. But I personally was always really passionate about people and psychology. My mom is a psychotherapist and I grew up reading all of those books. And as I was working really hard helping CEOs grow their companies, it really struck me that we as human beings don't take nearly the same kind of rigorous approach to our lives. And we all agree that life is our most precious enterprise and shouldn't we treat it with the same rigor? Um, and exactly for that reason i have oh amazing thank you oh, exactly for that reason i have uh, founded life startup so life startup is actually a covid baby as i was traveling the world i took a gap year last year and i was traveling the world got stuck in south korea with no friends no family and hardly any any person speaking english i had plenty of deep work time to focus on building this company and so we are on a mission to make the, the world more fulfilled and why fulfilled why fulfillment is so important so in the topic of personal development we have nailed quite well the kind of top of this pyramid that you see on the screen we all know quite a fair amount about the habits, maybe some of the daily planning. We all are meditating, maybe having Headspace installed on our phones. 
And most of us even do annual planning and goals and prioritization and all of those things. So those kind of the, the things that you see in the life design and tactical implementation quadrants. But what I'm seeing a lot of is that this fundamental level of the strategy is often ignored and maybe not so much from the personal perspective. Some of us are quite self-aware in our values, what we like, what we don't like, what gives us energy, but what often ignored um, and what companies always look at in the business world is how the outer world is changing, how it's changing the landscape. And there are a lot of changes that are happening in the world that are impacting our lives and quite fundamentally in some very profound ways. There's some technological trends, there's some societal trends, there are economic trends. And it's really critical to look at the intersection of those two things to actually be fulfilled. And so this is exactly um, the topic for today because the world is undergoing this radical change and it creates radical opportunities as well. But it also requires this radical mindset shift to embrace those opportunities. And so what is this radical future of life, work, play in the modern society and how can you make the most of it? We have put together seven trends that are, we believe are shaping the way we live, work and play. Um, and it was quite, quite a surprise for us to see how quite a lot of those changes have been accelerated by what was going on in the last few months. And so it's really, really becoming quite radical. Um, and so because of the time, we only have 25 minutes for this presentation. I will only focus on the first four trends, but hopefully this will give you enough food for thought already and won't be an information overkill sometimes less is more but you can always download the full trends report on our website and i will also share the link in the end of the presentation so trend number one um probably my favorite one and i'm really curious to, to know if anybody of you have heard about that trend before maybe you can type it into your chat box if you have ever heard anything about 100 year life um, and as you do that i also would like you to scan the qr code you see on the screen and if you're dialing in from your desktop you can just go to menti.com and type in the code you see on the screen and i'll just keep it there for a little bit and i'll switch the screen and yeah, if you get in, you can just go ahead and answer the question that you see on the screen. And the question is, how long do you think is the life longevity in Hong Kong in 2020? All right, some interesting, quite a lot of controversy around this uh, question I'm seeing already. Okay, let's give it a few time for a few more people. Yeah, has everybody voted? One last chance. Okay, so, and the answer is, 84.9 and actually only um two of you have guessed correctly it's quite remarkable hong kong is actually one of the of the record breaking um countries in the world in terms of the life longevity all right then on to the question number two what do you think was the average life expectancy in hong kong 70 years ago in 1950 a caveat here, I was trying to find one that was on 100 years ago, but there's no stats apparently for that, so, which is understandable. All right, let's see. And the answer is 
Yeah, it was actually um, a little bit lower than most of you have guessed. It was 61.5. So you probably guessed where I'm going with all of these questions. And in just 70 years, the life longevity has increased by 23 and a half years in Hong Kong. And kind of similar story happens all over the world as well. So life longevity is increasing and most children in the developed world that are born today will very likely live to more than 100 years old. And actually quite a lot of us on this call are very, very likely to reach that milestone as well. And while this sounds like a really cool and exciting thing, um, it has quite a lot of implications on all areas of our lives really. And so, if you live until 100 years, just think about it for a moment and let it sink. How will you sustain yourself for this extra 10, 20, 30 years? Will you retire later or will you try and earn more or will you, will you stay in the workforce? And if you, if you decide to stay in the workforce for longer, how will you stay relevant in that workforce? Things change so fast. We all have to upskill ourselves so many times already. And if you're going to stay in the workforce for extra 20, 30 years, it will have a lot more impact. And so even if you decide to, okay, cool, I'm staying in my profession, I'm going to be doing this, I will stay relevant. How will you stay fulfilled in your profession? Let's say if, you, if you're doing marketing, um, and you still manage to learn all about the, the latest tools and trends and all of those things, will you, will you still enjoy it if, you, if you're going to do it for 50, 60, 70 years? But this also applies to relationships. What about your relationships? If you're going to live into 100 years, is it actually feasible to stay with one person for 70 or years? So in the old days where people lived until 30 years old, you kind of get married and you're 20s and then you tolerate your partner for, for, for 10, 10, 10 odd years and then you kind of die, problem solved. So there's also kind of some, some uh, bonuses to the shorter life. And if you have a partner for 70 years, is it feasible? Will you be able to do that? And also, will you structure your life differently? Now that you have a lot more time, will you maybe have children later? Or maybe you will change your careers halfway through your life? So quite a lot of some profound of, of these profound questions that this trend really raises. And so what is the radical opportunity? It's not just about these questions that we need to ask ourselves. The radical opportunity is that you can actually become everything you ever wanted. And I'm sure this creative crowd that we have here today is the kind of people who always have so many passions and uh, sometimes we feel frustrated that we can't pursue them all because there's just so much. Well, in the year of 100 year life, you can pursue quite a lot of those things. Maybe you can pursue a portfolio career. Portfolio career is um, when you combine, when you don't just have one career, but maybe you have one main career and a few side hassles, or you split your time equally between, between various careers. Um, I'll talk about it in a moment about myself. I actually do have a portfolio career. Or maybe you will decide to, to do your life differently. And instead of having a portfolio career or having all of the things at once, maybe you can do your life in different multiple stages. Let's say you will spend some time taking time off just solely to take care of your children while your partner is pursuing a career. And then you swap, then your partner stays with children, spends quality time, and then you dedicate yourself to your career and maybe halfway through you decide to reskill yourself entirely to another degree do a phd or something else um, so there's quite a lot of different options for for life design and same applies to relationships maybe having the one is not something that is going to work for you anymore maybe having multiple the ones is a new normal um, but it also will allow you to play with multiple identities. This is really exciting. This is a little bit what I'm doing when I worked back at Accenture. I, I was I was this corporate, you know, corporate woman sometimes still trying to pretend, pretend I'm one when I'm wearing jackets. Right now I'm this entrepreneur, I'm a minimalist, I'm wearing the same t-shirt, 
that kind of vibe and who knows maybe at some point i will i will play a role of a, of a professor at the university and so this, this example you see on the screen right now is one of my favorites. I really like showing it to my clients where when they start, oh my God, but I'm too old to change or is it too late or is it too big? Is it too scary? So this is a great example. Even if you at the age, let's say if you are 45 right now and at the age of 45, you have this crazy idea and decide to go for the most hard to get and hard to educate for professions, neurosurgeon takes you 10 years in training and might seem really not feasible because you're already 45, right? But if you think about it, even if you spend 10 years in training, you will still graduate at the age of 55. And if you're going to work until your mid eighties, that's, that's good. 30 years of your, of your career. So it's actually quite possible. And if that's possible for becoming a neurosurgeon, if you want to become a yoga instructor or someone else, that's just, very easy. <laughs> and so just a quick recap on my portfolio career. So I'm the founder of Life Startup. I travel the world with my laptop, like all of these folks um, you keep reading about sometimes. And then I am also a yoga teacher. Of course, the being a founder takes up most of my time, but I really enjoy teaching yoga. It allows me to move. It allows me to give back to people. So I really like that. And I'm also, I'm also an artist. Um, this is a, this is a serious hobby of mine that I turned into a career and I'm still experimenting if this is something that I want to make a career or if it's, if it's more of a hobby. And so right now I'm doing these three things, but maybe in the future, I will want to focus on just one. And maybe at some point I will want to go branch out and into some other careers as well. So the options are endless. So of course, this is an exciting trend. You can talk about it for hours and um, there is a wonderful book called The 100 Year Life. Uh, you don't have to write it down. There, are, if, you, if you want any of the resources you see on the screen, they're all on our website. So you can always go there and you can, you can even order books off Amazon right from there. So, uh, but I highly recommend this book if this, this trend really intrigued you. And it also talks about how, um, how the, what are the implications of this trend on some of the political systems on the on the society in um, at large and on the on the corporates all right so trend number two oysterization of the world so the world is indeed your oyster i think this is a great example right now i am here in switzerland you folks are in hong kong i know there's some people joining from singapore and maybe some other cities as well and that's remarkable and also some of the people i've met on in, in the breakout room there were some people from mexico and other places and, and i think this is super exciting so the world is indeed becoming the oyster and all of these borders are kind of uh removing and um in such a world without borders, I want you to reflect on these questions. Would you still live in one place as it's increasingly becoming easier and easier to move around, to travel, to integrate? Probably right now is a bad example. Yeah, that's still possible. I'm actually thinking of maybe going to Canary Islands in a couple of weeks time. So would you live in one place? Would you stay? Or maybe you would become a location independent. I think also what happened during this pandemic is a lot of people actually realized how being in the office physically doesn't necessarily make you more productive. So maybe location independence is not an utopia anymore. Maybe a lot more people can embrace this kind of lifestyle. And maybe this is something for you as well. And if that happens, would you actually own a home or would home become something else? Maybe the whole world become, will become this one huge Airbnb and everybody will just kind of move around all the time. Wouldn't that be cool? I would certainly enjoy that. And also what would happen to annual holidays right now? It's like, it's kind of a common thing. Of course we travel, we do small trips for the weekend, but normally if we want to travel abroad somewhere for a couple of weeks, we do one or two big trips, but the rest of the time we're kind of based in one place. And what if, what if your whole life could become this one big annual holiday? So what is the radical opportunity for this trend for the oysterization of the world? 
it's really the playground. The world is your playground these days and you can make your own rules. So you can weave in your work and play. And I think a lot more companies are also starting to adapt to that and uh, start making it possible. And maybe if you are a company owner or if you, if you have the power to change that, I personally would really encourage you to look into that space because this is really the future. If you want to keep and retain your best talent, you really need to make sure that you make it work for their whole kind of life and lifestyle. And also it's important, it's, it's really easy to make business across borders. I can give you an example of my company. I actually have clients all over the world. Um, in a few hours, I have a client from Beijing and I have a client in Toronto and I, my whole team are based all over the world. In fact, I have two girls at the moment working on, some, on a piece one is based in Tokyo and one is based in Brazil and they really struggle with time zones and it's always a nightmare, but it's amazing. It's indeed amazing. The whole, the whole world is our oyster. And it also creates opportunities um, for challenging what home is. Uh, as we talked before, maybe you don't need a home anymore. Maybe you don't need to own a home as such. So global career opportunities, like some of you I'm sure are already exploring that. I've seen some, um, some people who are, who are not from Hong Kong originally, but also global talent pool. Imagine that the whole world is your talent pool and you are not tied to this one location anymore. Uh, imagine the kind of diversity you can bring. And this is what I'm totally loving about my team of people who are from, from Kenya, New Zealand, and Lithuania, and Brazil, and Japan. And it's just amazing. It's the kind of diversity and some of the ideas those people have. I would never be able with my background to, to get to those ideas ever by myself. So is this possible? Well, in theory, yes. In practice, I wouldn't recommend working kind of like this. It's not very productive. It's a, it's a myth that digital nomads work like this. You won't enjoy the beach. You won't get anything done. So I suggest you do your work and then you go and enjoy the beach. But are digital nomads or any other kind of remote workers more equally or less productive? What do you think? Maybe you can type in the answer in the chat box. I will be curious to see. Aha, uh -huh, equal or more. Hmm. Well, a recent study, if, if, if you know, if you ever have a boss who says, you know, I want you in the office, <laughs> or if you ever want to go and, you know, live in another country for a couple of months, um, and connect remotely and your boss objects, you can always show them the stats. Stanford University, respectable um, place, they say that remote workers are in fact 13% more productive than in office workers and they take fewer sick days. And so this is kind of a quick snapshot of my life in the past 12 months. Of, you can see me on the beach, you can see me in Russian mountains, lots of, lots of uh, seaside, but at the same time, I actually have managed to achieve so much i've never been able to achieve that and the reason for that is because i worked around my schedule when i'm most productive i took really good care of my needs whenever i needed to take a break i do that and this really allows me to be super productive so this is possible for sure so if you'd like to know more a couple of things i'd like to recommend if you haven't read uh, the book from Timothy, Timothy Ferris, uh, the four hour work week, he shares some kind of cool practical tips on how to, how to embrace this kind of lifestyle and travel the world and live and work remotely. And if, you, if you're looking for kind of a little bit of this kind of nomad vibe and what it looks like, you can go on Nomad List. It's a cool resource where you can explore different nomadic destinations and it kind of shares with you the cost of living and some of the tips and it gives you a really good snapshot into the life of digital nomads. All right, loosening social rigidity. So why do we always care why people, what people say, what people think? And of course, society is changing, but we do because we are tribe animals. And a number of years ago, a number of centuries ago, if you are excluded from your tribe and you have to get to do it on your own, you're probably, you must probably going to die in a matter of a few days. And this sits so deeply in us 
that we really struggle with making our own rules and kind of paving our own path. And so we're always looking at the tribe. And I think for, for, for the for the more of the creative and brave folks, we're probably a lot more um, braver in that sense. But we're, we're still humans and we still look at the tribe. But good news is that the tribe is indeed loosening its social rigidity. People are becoming a lot more chilled about everyone's choices. As you can obviously see with some of the of the gender um, gender equality things going on with some of the um, sexual sexuality um, etc so the tribe is indeed becoming a lot more okay with how you live who you live with how you love how you what you do with your life do you have children do you not have children so it's really exciting so now that the tribe is okay with your choices would you actually explore alternative relationships models maybe there are a lot of there is an increasing um, majority uh, and there is an increasing variety of this kind of alternative relationships emerging like open relationships uh, or polyamorous relationships. For instance, would you redefine your gender roles, maybe in your household, maybe with your partner, maybe with your parents, maybe with your uh, children as well? Would you design your life differently? Um, I actually have a couple of examples to bring this trend to life a little bit more. So um, you can see on the screen is, is Steffi and Nico and they are my friends and they live in Amsterdam and they're a really cool couple and I really turn to them for inspiration a lot. So they're both product designers, really cool creative folks and when they had their, their first son, Nathan, they decided that they both will just take uh, will work one day less a week. So they didn't take turns to take care of their son, but so three days a week, uh, four days a week, their son would go to daycare and then they would both take a day off on the same day so that they all three as a family can spend that time together because for them, they really value that family time and they really wanted to do that. And so instead they decided to get really careful with their expenses and cut down on their expenses so that they can actually invest in their in, in, in what really matters to them. Another example, also Dutch people, probably Dutch people are known for being so super brave. So you can see the photo on the screen, same girl, and she is with a woman and with a guy. And so the, the guy on the right, he's my friend, and he told me a story when he was, you know, in his 30s and he hasn't met a woman that he wants to have a child with. And, but she had a friend who was in a similar situation. And so they both agreed to just have a child together and and raise a child together, not being a, fam a traditional family. And so you can see obviously there, their daughter Nico and she, she already, she's already um, grown and it's a, it's a happy family, but in their own way. So what is the radical opportunity? We love this quote that you can see on the screen, be a chef, not a cook. So, you know, cooks, they have the recipe, they follow the recipe and chefs, they know how to do the recipe, but they kind of invent their own rules. And that means that you can design your life and your way because the tribe, the society is increasingly okay with that. And you can actually be who you want to be and really show others the way. So some of the examples you saw, especially example with Rob and, and him uh, raising a daughter with a friend, I think it's a great example, a very empowering example to just invent something that works for you and not looking at kind of the society, what the society expects and actually be a role model. For me, he's a huge inspiration. It's maybe something um, I, I, could, I could see myself considering maybe at some point in my life. So maybe you could be that person that will take a step back and think, maybe I, I want to do life differently and maybe somebody else will get inspired by that. So I really urge you to do that. A couple of examples of books that you can uh, look at. So more than two is a great kind of intro into alternative relationship models and 30 something and over it is a great um, novel um, that talks about how you can how you can do life your way. So it's, it's a very easy read. So if you're on holidays, or I really recommend that one. And last but not least, 
and I think it really wraps up this presentation quite nicely is that actually there's quite a lot of choice and all of these things are becoming possible. You can live anywhere, you can work anywhere, you can be anyone, you can do, you can have children, not have children, you know, be this, be that. It's amazing, exciting. And then how do you choose? So um, there's been a study that you have too much choice you get really paralyzed, you can't choose. So this, this jam study when participants were offered to try 24 jars of jam, only 3% could actually choose the one that they liked and bought it. When they reduced the sample to only six jars of jam, 30% bought it. So clearly less choice sometimes and oftentimes is actually more. Um, there's another example, which is a donkey dilemma when a donkey that is equally thirsty and equally hungry is presented with both food and water, the donkey will not be able to decide what to do first, eat or drink, and then the donkey will die out of either thirst or starvation. So how can you, how can you avoid this kind of donkey dilemma and with so much choice, with so many options in life, how can you navigate all of these options how can you know what's right for you and also how can you get unstuck i think that's a huge that's a huge called paralysis of choice you stay you get really paralyzed when you have so much choice you just you just you might end up living your whole life just the way it is because you don't know what else to go after first don't worry there is a solution <laughs> there is an opportunity of course, you have to figure out who you really are and what you really want first, but you don't have to be stuck. If anybody here is familiar with the concept of kind of lean experimentation or sprints or design thinking, there is a lot of that kind of iterative approach. Same now bleeds into life like quite a lot. So what we suggest you do instead of like deciding to be stuck in one thing or completely changing say your career, you can do experiments and you see if it's something for you. Or you can also go for portfolio careers or multiple stages for life. You can decide for yourself, okay, maybe I'll combine these three things for now. And maybe, you know, in five years time, I'll do these three things. So you don't, you, you, you're not paralyzed with all the options, but you just pick a few options and you start with those options and then you go. So you get unstuck. And of course, declutter. Um, maybe when you have too many options, just try to eliminate some. Of course, we like, even though we live until 100 years old, we can't do it all. So you have to say no to some things. So it's, it's all about strategy. Strategy is all about saying, knowing what to say no to. And so how it works in practice, I really like this example. So for example, you are in a corporate career, you've always been thinking, maybe I want to live somewhere in Australia, be a surf instructor and live this kind of cool surf or vibe lifestyle. But you're too scared to quit your job altogether and go and become a surfing instructor. And you don't have to. So what you can do is you can take a sabbatical or you can even take a month off. I think most of us can, can, can manage to do that. I just try out a lifestyle for, for one month. So don't make it your holiday, but just try and imagine that you're actually living there. And you might learn that it's something for you and it will be very easy for you to go ahead and make that change. But you also might learn that there are some things you like, there are some things you don't like. And then you might learn from that, then you might change kind of your idea, pivot a little bit, try a new thing and kind of do those tweaks until you get to what it is that really works for you. So if you'd like to learn more, you can watch this cool TED talk on the paradox of choice, explains the science behind it. And um, if you want to learn more about portfolio careers, there's also a book on that. And that brings us to the end, to the summary. So four trends we talked about today, 100 year life, which means you can become everything you ever wanted. Oysterization of the world. The world is indeed your oyster and it's your playground. You can embrace it. Loosening social rigidity. The tribe is okay with you doing your thing, so you can invent your new models and maybe be a trailblazer and show others the way. Abundance of choice. Stop being a donkey uh, in the donkey situation, paralyze the choice and maybe focus on what you really want, who you really are. And, just go and experiment. 
And so the other trends, as I mentioned, you can download the full report that also talks about the trends I mentioned today and all of the, all of the other ones on our website, yourlifestartup.co. And I wanted to close with a quote from Abraham Lincoln that the best way to predict the future is to create it. And my mission today um, was to, to really give you food for thought and it's really in our hands to create this future, this new world and and be the leaders that can show others, others the way. So this is where you can download the trends report if you go on our website. There's a section called tools and resources and this is what it looks like, the future of us 2020 trends report. That's where you click and you will get the report right away. And for those of you who got really intrigued by the things that I said today, um, and you feel that you might need some inspiration or maybe you want to explore more about you or the options that are out there and get some, some inspiring examples from other people. We have designed a 16 week program, which is called Life Strategy Quest. Uh, and you can see on the illustration here, it starts very messy and you know, you don't know what you want, what are the options and then kind of slowly, slowly working your way through and starting experimenting with things and then you end up living the kind of life um, that, that really fulfills you and that's in sync with who you really are. So you can also check about this on our website. Um, we also have a community, so you can like us on Facebook, on Instagram. We are on LinkedIn, we have a YouTube channel, and of course, uh, there's a bunch of things you can find on our website. All right, and now I'll stop talking and open the floor to the questions. Thank you, Natalia. Um, maybe if you can stop sharing the screen and we can see everyone on the grid view. Um, so we've got about five minutes left. If anyone's got a question, just go ahead and directly unmute. Uh, you can ask Natalia directly. Anyone brave enough to go first? It's too much food for thought. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I'll start if no one's got, got anything at the moment. Um, I'm just curious, I mean, out of all these trends, these are quite radical, right? It, especially in Asia. So I'm just thinking like, which of these trends do you really see people in Asia or Hong Kong adapting to the most? I think 100 year life is, is something that we are adapting. And I think Asian people historically have been, have been quite, quite good at that and ma managing kind of um, older age. Um, we're certainly not as good as, at that as we are uh, in Europe, for sure. Maybe loosening social rigidity less. So I can imagine that some of this kind of new, really, I, I certainly feel that when I travel from Europe to Asia, kind of these new relationship models are bit of a still a bit of a taboo at least that's kind of my perception would you say that that's true yeah i think so probably i, I mean i haven't spent enough time in europe so i, I can't really say but i would assume uh, so. now, hong kong is a very international city so i think oysterization of the world certainly applies to it because there's so many expats it's, it's such a melting pot i think it's a really good example actually of this trend mm -hmm. and abundance of choice as well i mean hong kong is there's so much choice like, even even picking where to eat is a nightmare because there's so many, so many good food. Exactly. I think I find myself Googling, you know, what are the new bars or restaurants in Hong Kong like when it was open um, every week and then there was just too much time on it. I mean, we had this conversation about, you know, when even like shopping online, if you, if the Chinese people shop on Taobao or like, you know, Amazon or whatever, you end up clicking on all these recommended items or there's all these things on the side and then you sort of just end up like saying, I don't want to deal with this right now. And you don't even buy anything going back to the, the jars example that you had. Yeah, it's, it's that's so true. Um, I, yeah, there's one comment from me. Hi, I'm Letitia. Um, uh, this is all very interesting. What I feel, you know, as a, as a thread is also the freedom, the freedom to choose, you know, your own life and that the world has become more of a, of a free place, free of your own, of your own choices and how you want to craft your life. But it's true that Hong Kong in a way and, and, and Chinese culture is um, maybe, and that, that's the question I want to ask is also uh, about education, about educating our own children. Because now the, the, um, the educational path uh, and also in Hong Kong are still very traditional. 
Uh, we don't know about all the jobs, the new jobs, about all these new ways to, to design our own lives. Uh, educating our children, we're still very much uh, imprinted with, uh, with what our, our, uh, our parents have, um, have taught us, uh, which is much more uh, conservative. And, um, and Asia is still a bit conservative in a way. It's changing, of course, but um, you expect your children to be uh, first in math, and then um, uh, go to the best university, and uh, and this this um, this uh, this this path is not maybe the the, the best way to uh, to reach a successful life, and uh, and that's also your message. Um, how um, how would you how would you lead your children, uh, you know, little ones into this new path, you know, uh, through because they still need to go to school. I mean, what is your? I'd love I'd love to have your advice on that. Uh, thank you. So th I think that's a really good question. I have spent quite a bit of time in South Korea uh, earlier this year, and it's been really quite heart heartbreaking for me because all of the, quite a lot of the people that I met there, they were quite miserable in the sense that it's a very oppressive culture and people are not focusing on what they really want and what makes them happy, but they're really co all constantly trying to comply with those social norms and rules. And it's just not the kind of life that I think would be fulfilling. And so I think one thing I would certainly want to instill in my children is just, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how successful you are in the eyes of other people because other people, they don't care. And I say the same thing to my clients. Nobody gives um, a damn about how you live your life. People seem that they do, but they don't. They're all busy with their own life. So if you're going to live your life trying to impress others, you're not gonna it, it's not gonna lead you anywhere so it's really i think it's actually and actually this is another thing i'm saying to my clients that it's a lot easier to achieve things and it's a lot easier to be successful than to say to yourself that look this is not what makes me happy and i just will be less successful in the eyes of the society and i will just hold on hold my ambition and this is what i'm struggling with myself right now i've left consulting i've had a burnout i'm very ambitious and right now i'm thinking well, maybe i should build this multi-million dollar tech business and i'm really thinking is this something that will make me happy and really it's a difficult choice and i think that probably won't make me happy and i think i will probably choose to not go for that yeah. There are very nice studies about, you know, the ideas, the values of femininity and masculinity also about, uh, you know, how to how to have a successful career, how to be successful, that are more masculine um, energies and that uh, we need more feminine energies in the world where a life should be uh, should be led by, um, um, you know, not the idea of success or um, in, in a tr more traditional way, but um, uh, more in tune with our own um, with our own emotions and, and, and own happiness. Thank you, Luigi. I think that's a really good 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 thing to add to my kind of thinking. I'll look into that topic. Thank you. Anyone else have questions or comments? I think there's some comments in the chat, Natalia, from a couple of people. Uh, I, yeah, I, I saw that Simon said that there, there's some radical ideas for Hong Kong especially and this is precisely the reason why I really want to talk more about this kind of things in Asia and I think this is the right crowd if anything and I said that message multiple times that I really want you to lead that change, it's not going to happen overnight, it requires um, quite a lot of courage and quite a lot of boldness and I don't necessarily invite you to embrace all of those trends and you know quit your job, become a, become a digital nomad, have multiple relationships, all of those things. But maybe, you know, it's like even small, small things. Maybe next time you're doing something, you can take a step back and ask yourself, well, is this something that I really want? Is this something that society wants me to do? Can I do it differently? And yeah, maybe society will say something first, but maybe then will adapt because that's how, that's how change happens. It's got to start somewhere. Great. And I think there's another comment from Sylvia that she had to, she had to drop. Unfortunately, I think people are starting their day now. Um, I think she was just saying the whole thing around monogamy wasn't a choice, wasn't the choice of the social elite. Um, she's like, I wonder how this is really being explored and how do people take steps towards this option? Uh, sorry, I guess against monogamy is probably what she's saying. 
was the top? I'm, I'm just looking. I'm just reading through the comment. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, 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 no worries, no worries. So actually, yeah. So what I was, what I wanted to, do, um, well, um, because we had limited time, I didn't really elaborate on this, this trend in full. But um, the reason we have this, um, there's so much choice also to have multiple partners or even live by yourself is also um, economically defined. It's the first time in human history where we actually not, um, we don't have to economically cohabit with someone. This monogamy has also been defined by economic uh, conditions because we had to tolerate as spouses. Right now I can, I can sustain myself. I don't need a husband. I don't need to live with my family. It might seem that, you know, with this kind of tribe animals and that's why we live in, in communities and in back, back in Soviet Russia where I was born, there were plenty of, you know, families living in teeny tiny apartments all together, not out of choice but actually out of necessity. So it's also this choice kind of stems from, from the rapid economic development and also creating opportunities. Great. Um, thanks so much, Natalia. I think we're just gonna, we're gonna have to say bye now. We're a little a couple of minutes um, after, but thanks so much for sharing your thoughts. And um, the report, I think for everyone, you can go on your website, is that right? And, and download the report there. And I'll send out um, a link later on as well. Um, this talk will be online. Uh, sorry, I think see, Simon has something. This talk will be online um, hopefully later today. So feel free to share it with others. Um, and thanks everyone for joining. Happy Friday and, and have a great weekend. Happy Friday. Have a great weekend. Thank you. So nice to meet all of you. You're such a cool crowd. <laughs> thank you. Have a good weekend. Bye guys. Thank, thank you. you. All right, I'm going to sign off. Bye, Natalia. Thanks so much, guys.